Hello, and welcome back to the Worcester Senior Center Stay Connected Programming on Channel 192. My name is Suki Lapin, and I am the Program Coordinator here at the Worcester Senior Center. Today, we welcome back Dr. Martha Gatch, Education Manager and Conservation Coordinator for Mass Audubon Broad Meadow Brook Wildlife Sanctuary and Conservation Center, who will present Wildlife in Winter. Hear about the wildlife species we can see in Worcester, or at least see their tracks, and learn what they do to survive during the cold months. Welcome back, Martha. Thank you so much, Suki, and it's great to be with you again and talking about the seasons that we are experiencing right now, wildlife in winter. So I'm coming to you from Mass Audubon um, at Broad Meadow Brook here in Worcester. And here's what we are going to do today. So I would like to start out with an acknowledgement and gratitude. We'll take a look at the challenges of winter that our wildlife are experiencing. And because trees, I consider trees to be part of our, our wildlife array, let's talk about trees and how they get through the winter. And then different strategies that our different wildlife are using to make it through the cold, dry season that we call in winter. And then finally, how you can enjoy looking for and recognizing some of those wildlife that we have right here in Worcester. So here we go. Mass Audubon has a network of sanctuaries throughout the Commonwealth. And we acknowledge that all of them are located on the traditional, contemporary, and unceded territories of indigenous nations, including the Nipmuc. These lands were taken from the indigenous people and they create a legacy of trauma that persists even to today. We are also very, very grateful that indigenous stewardship of the land that we now call Massachusetts has kept its ecological communities, the wildlife that we're about to talk, of which we're about to talk, has kept its ecological communities vibrant, strong, and interconnected for thousands of years. And we acknowledge that far from being relics of the past, indigenous peoples, including the 37,000 individuals who currently live in Massachusetts, are still at the forefront of environmental protection, ecological stewardship, and climate mitigation. With gratitude, thank you. So here we go for Worcester, for, for winter in Worcester, for winter in New England. Um, winter is a, the season of cold and snow, but water is pretty scarce. Why do we have winter? We have winter because the tilt of the earth and the angle of the earth's orbit around the sun puts the sun squarely in the southern hemisphere below the equator. It's at its farthest point from the northern hemisphere during winter. Winter solstice takes place in December 21st or so. And on the solstice during that time period, our daylight is starved. We only get nine hours and five minutes of day length of sunshine during the day. And our average temperatures at the beginning of, was beginning of winter for Worcester are about a high of 41 and a low of 26. So that's around the freezing point of water, the 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the point at which water turns from liquid to solid, AKA ice and snow. Oh, and I forgot that my, my world turns. So there's, you have the, the spinning world. In addition to the cold, which many people think is the primary of challenge of winter, getting water is also an incredible challenge for, um, for many of our wildlife including for our trees. The water is locked up as ice. Um, it is locked up as snow and it can be very difficult in general for wildlife to get water. If they do get it, it's going to be cold and it's going to lower their body temperature. So all of the survival strategies that we see 
are about warming up and trying to maintain a steady temperature while keeping enough water in your body that your body can operate normally. So let's take a look at trees. It's an easy starting point. They're all around us. They're easy to see. I bet if you look out your window right now, you're going to see at least one tree. So we have two kinds of trees in New England. We have evergreens and we have trees that lose their leaves, so deciduous trees. In the wintertime, all trees become dormant. It's simply too cold for them to do photosynthesis. So like all of our wildlife, their metabolism slows down and they're all about conserving energy and conserving water loss. So their challenges are cold and icy nut because you don't wanna freeze because that damages your, your body, your cells. You want to keep any moisture inside you. You wanna keep from drying out. And you wanna keep as much as a constant temperature as you can. So you want to avoid these cycles of freezing and thawing. So how do we do that? Well, it's a little bit different for our conifer trees, our evergreens, which tend to have these, these really thin needle-like leaves. And then for our trees that lose their leaves during the winter. Those are our deciduous trees. So I think we're gonna take a look at the deciduous first. Yep, here we go. So deciduous trees lose their leaves every winter because they're trying to keep their water loss minimized. They wanna keep water inside. How they do that is a process called abscission. So where the leaf meets the twig, there are cells that grow at the end of the leaf stem and at the end of the twig, and they form a wall, two walls through which nothing, not even water can pass. That means that the leaf is going to die and fall off. That process is called abscission. And there's a scar on the twig that tells you where the leaf used to be last summer. That leaf scar acts like a, a, any kind of a scar that you get on your body or a scab on your body. It keeps your body from leaking and it protects it from bacteria or cold air coming in. So that's what the leaf scar does. You may say, but I see trees that have dead leaves on them. Our oak trees, for example, and if you happen to live where there are beech trees, you'll see also that beeches keep their leaves on through the winter. Well, surprise, oaks and beeches are cousins. They belong to the same family of trees. That family of trees originated in the tropical areas down near the, the equator where there isn't any cold and the trees don't have to lose their leaves all at once. So they, have, they don't have the ability to form that layer of cells and kick the leaves off. So their leaves just dry up and hang on through the winter. They'll lose them in the spring when the new leaves come out. In contrast, we have our evergreens or conifers because they make cones. That's where their seeds are. And their leaves are thin, they're long, they're needle-like, and they have a waxy coat on them. And that keeps water inside the tree. So even though they keep their needles on through the winter, they're still minimizing the water loss. The shape of that leaf, of that needle, keeps snow in general from piling on the trees um, and keeps the, the branches flexible so they tend not to break in heavy snows, maybe during a windstorm, but not during heavy snows. That long thin shape of the needle also protects the inner leaf and it allows some passage for minerals, for a little bit of water. If they're able to photosynthesize in the, in the winter, they will, they will do that. And that food can then come into, the, into the, um, the main part of the tree. So our conifer trees are, they're acting slowly through the winter, but they still have a functioning needle. The advantage of keeping your leaves on through the winter 
is that you can start up making food, photosynthesizing, as soon as spring temperatures warm up enough to let you do that. So you get a head start on every other tree. So that's our conifers. If you have a rhododendron plant somewhere nearby, you might notice that when it gets really cold, the leaves droop down and curl up. So this plant is acting like a thermometer. You can look outside and see, well, do I need my really heavy coat today or can I get by with, with a lighter jacket? The plant on the left is experiencing cold weather. You can see all of the leaves are kind of drooping down. When it gets really, really cold, they curl up tightly. And the reason that they do that is because below the temperature of freezing, they, are, they want to minimize the exposure of the leaf to freezing temperatures, to the cold air. And so it's vertical, it doesn't get much sunlight, so it, it can't heat up and go through that freeze-thaw cycle, and it curls up. So again, it's minimizing its surface area to keep the cold air from, from really getting into the shrub and impacting the leaf. So now we get to the animals. And we have this fun, fun acronym for different ways, the different strategies that our wildlife survive the winter. Here we have a beautiful barred owl and a snowstorm. You can see that this owl is right in the middle of the picture. I don't know, Suki, can you nod your head if you see the cursor? Okay, so here's the owl, really well camouflaged. It's really hard to see owls because they blend in so well. They're really, really good at it. So usually they'll give themselves away by flying or by calling. But if you can actually see one, consider yourself extremely lucky. So our wildlife will either migrate, they will get the heck out of Dodge, they will stay active during the winter. Think of deer, for example, you'll see them any time of year. They will sleep the winter away. These are bears or raccoons, or they will actually hibernate. And we're gonna go through these, not necessarily in this order, but we're gonna start with migration. So here are some examples of two kinds of animals that leave, they go elsewhere during the winter. A Baltimore Oriole on the left, We'll start to see these about the beginning of May. And then our monarch butterflies, which we will see up until the end of September. And then we won't see them again until maybe June. If we're lucky, maybe we'll see one or two in May. Where do they go? Well, our Baltimore Oriole is here in the orange part in the summer, but in the blue in the winter, it goes down to Florida or the Caribbean or Central and Northern South America. So these birds bridge two different continents. They are our link between the Northern and the Southern hemisphere, which is really cool and really amazing when you think about the energy and the effort that it takes to get there. And then the monarchs will fly down to, we're gonna follow the red arrow arrows and in the east, the red arrows will lead us to the middle of Mexico. There are some tall mountains down there. The butterflies on the other side of the Rockies will winter along the coast of California and northern Mexico. And just because monarchs are so fascinating and because it's really nice to be able to see butterflies in the middle of winter, let's spend a moment or two on monarch migration. So the top slides, the top pictures are different stages in the monarch life cycle. So we have an egg, the caterpillar, the chrysalis, and then the adult butterfly. And in the fall, our butterflies here in Worcester will fly along the east coast. Some will go to Florida and the majority will go to the highlands, to the mountains of Mexico, to a very small area down there. About now, and, and they hang out, they hang out in these fir trees and they don't do a whole lot. Um, they're conserving energy. There are flowers that they can, they can use to 
feed on down there. But about now they're starting to wake up and they're going to move back north. So they come out of Mexico and they head up to Texas. That's the first generation. They will go through a whole life cycle there. They'll lay eggs, the adults will die, the eggs will turn into caterpillars and then into adults. And that next generation will fly up until about Virginia or so. And then they'll do it all again, one more generation. And then those adult butterflies will fly up to New England and parts north. So we're seeing the great grandchildren of the butterflies that left us last fall. How they know how to do that, scientists are still trying to, to tease that out. Um, we have an idea that it has to do with the Earth's magnetic field and the angle of the sun that they're using to migrate. But all of that information is contained in a little tiny butterfly brain. So never ever think that butterflies are stupid. <laughs> they, they know a lot. Second strategy is to hibernate. And we tend to use hibernation very, very loosely as a term, but when you, when you take it in its technical sense, it's a lowering of your body metabolism, a lowering of the body temperature and heart rate and breathing. And it's very hard to come out of that. It takes about a week to wake up. The three kinds of animals that are true hibernators here in New England are a little mouse called the meadow jumping mouse, which really can jump kind of like a kangaroo. A couple of our bats, our little brown bat, and to a lesser extent, our big brown bat that we may have in our houses. And then groundhogs or woodchucks, which we all know February 2nd was Groundhog Day. And we have differing, um, differing expectations of whether or not we're gonna have an early spring depending on which groundhog you listen to. So these are our true hibernators, but we have animals who are semi-hibernators. And the most famous of those are going to be our black bears. The black bears will stuff themselves to the gills in the fall. They will eat garbage. They will clean out your bird feeders. They will, they're looking for berries and honey and absolutely anything else that they can use to fatten themselves up for this long winter's nap. They'll look for a den that may be in a brush pile. Um, it may be in some overgrown grasses or under a log, it doesn't have to be a cave. They can be pretty exposed. And the females in the middle of winter will give birth to between one and three cubs. And those cubs will be awake in winter. They will sleep a lot, they will nurse a lot. The female is kind of sorta awake, let's say really, really groggy. And then when spring comes, the bears wake up, wake up and they are hungry and they need to go out and eat. Mama will bring her cubs with her and then they'll go off into the woods and do their normal bear activities um, until it all starts over again in the fall. We have a lot of black bears. We have never seen a black bear at Broadmeadow Brook, but I just can't imagine that that we won't at some time because people have seen them in different places in Worcester. So yes, we do have bears in Worcester, pretty cool. And then we have our sleepers. These are things like raccoons and skunks and chipmunks. Chipmunks are not true hibernators. They will, they make their burrows about three feet underground they have an entrance hole and an exit hole and they seal that up. So they have a front door and a back door. They seal that up so that you can't ever see it, it's invisible. And then on warm winter days and spring, they will come out, they'll wake up, come out and be active. Underground, they have stored acorns and seeds and any other food that will, that will keep. They wake up every so often, they go to the bathroom, they have a little snack, they go back to their bedroom and they go back to sleep and take another nap. 
I saw a chipmunk. We're at February 22nd. I saw a chipmunk out and about two days ago when it was nice and warm. So they're, they're waking up now. And if you, you know, think about when you see skunks or when you see raccoons or opossums, it's never in the dead of winter because these guys are in a nice protected space. Maybe it's under a deck, maybe it's in the hollow of an old tree, sheltering from the winter, taking a nice deep nap. And then they come out about this time of year and all of a sudden we start seeing skunks that haven't made it across the road in time, um, which is a sign of their, of their activity. And I have seen skunks in the middle of Worcester. And then we have a class of animals that stay active all winter long. Um, I have a bobcat in here because there have been reports of bobcats in, in Worcester, particularly in the northern part. They're very shy. If you see a bobcat, consider yourself lucky. And again, moose, we have seen moose wandering the streets of Worcester. Um, it's, I think there was one on King Street last summer and it's always, it's always an event. So you can't discount anything. So all of these animals, coyotes, and then you can probably think of, of others, foxes and deer, for example, are all active in winter. The squirrels and some of the other animals may sit out the particularly heavy storms um, in a sheltered space and you won't see them for a day or two, but then they do come out. The bird at the top right is a white-throated sparrow. And we have several birds that come down from the north to spend the winter in our the tropical climate that is Worcester, tropical for them because they're usually up on the top of Mount Greylock um, or further north in Canada where it's nice and cool. So this is their, their winter vacation land. And these birds, as well as chickadees, nuthatches, many of the birds that come to our feeders stay active all winter long. And so all of these animals have strategies to deal with the cold and the snow and the ice and the lack of water. I also did want to include this little guy because this is a really common animal, this meadow vole. If you live in a place where there is a lawn or you're next to a ball field and maybe the the grass grows a little bit longer on the edge of the field or an orchard or near a wetland, you will find these little guys. These are rodents like mice. I like to think of them as a mouse on steroids because they're, they're a little bit like the Arnold Schwarzenegger of, of mice the, with their big broad shoulders. They are the bottom of the food chain. They are potato chips for everybody else. They breed very early, very young. It takes them three weeks, 21 days to get a litter to the point where it can be born. And they have an average of four to five, but as many as nine babies at a time. So they are, they're, they, they're, the vole population is pretty high and it cycles up and down in periods of about four years at a time. So year one, we could have a, just a few voles. Year four, we could have a tremendous number of voles and then the population would crash again. These things are all around and you may see them or see evidence of them now. If we have snow, maybe you have noticed these, these trails through the snow that look like little train tracks and they branch and they, they go off. Um, but these are where voles have tunneled under the snow. They would rather not be exposed because they know that they are potato chips for everybody else. So they wanna use the snow to hide in. They have places where they go to the bathroom. They have places where they store food. They have a whole network that they have mapped out. And there is a whole lot of life that happens under the snow cover. We just are able to see these guys tunnels when we have just a little bit of snow on top. When the snow melts, you may see these, these tunnels again in your yard. They're not actually tunneling into the dirt. 
that's what um, moles do, regular moles. These are voles with a B. But they have these regular pathways that they wear into the ground. And so people might get upset about seeing these in their lawn. They're going to go away once the spring comes and the soil swells up again and the grass grows. You will, you will never notice them. So it's just a sign that you have a healthy ecosystem in your lawn. Gardeners may not like them because they have a tendency to chew on plant stems and they can cause winter damage in shrubs. Um, what I have learned from watching my shrubs over the year is that the shrubs are pretty good at recovering. So it's not, you don't, don't feel like you have to get rid of this particular shrub because it's, it's damaged. Um, it, it will come back. So please don't stress about the voles. They are necessary and needed in our ecosystem to support our other wildlife. So those guys remain active and they hide as much as they can, but there are other strategies that animals use. So these flying squirrels, which we have all around us, um, and they like to use cavities in, in trees or sometimes they're in people's attic. They are able to lower their metabolism for short periods of time and they snuggle together at night to conserve body warmth. Sometimes you'll find a nest of 20 or so of these and they're just cuddling together at night because it's warmer that way. These guys eat fungi. They eat nuts like these beech nuts. They eat berries such as wild roses or winter berries or other berries that you might find in the woods in the winter. And occasionally they will eat protein. Um, all of our squirrels are not 100% vegetarian. They will take advantage of things like eggs that they might find or even bury baby birds, unfortunately. Um, it's one of those truths of nature. So these guys have the flying squirrels have this fold of skin that allows them to glide from tree to tree that can't actually fly, but they can glide. And they know that they're also susceptible to predation. So they're active mostly at night. You can see they have these really big eyes. And the fun thing about them is if you see happen to see them, they'll land on a tree and they'll immediately scurry around to the other side so you can't see them anymore. So that's one of their strategies to hide from predators. Here's another sign that you might be able to see, especially if you go in some of the green spaces in Worcester where there are a lot of pine trees. So we have this huge pile of scales from pine cones. Here's our pine cone. And what's happened is that the seed is at the base of each one of these scales. And those seeds have been torn off of the, the pine cone stem core and eaten. And then the remaining shells have been discarded like you would go through a bag of peanuts. And the animal that does this is our red squirrel. So they will collect a food source that is very, very common. And they have a place where they like to go for breakfast and dinner and lunch. And they will eat their pine cones there, leave the garbage behind, and it will, it will recycle. So that's another strategy. Find a food source that there's a lot of. To stay on our topic of squirrels, our gray squirrels, which are active during the year, are famous for eating acorns as well as other things. And we have two kinds of acorns. We have um, acorns from white oaks and acorns from red and, and black oaks. And their chemistry is different. The white, or, white oak acorns will sprout immediately once they hit the ground. They, they, they wanna get going and germinate and grow a new tree very quickly. After they, they start sprouting, they don't taste as good and they're not as nutritious for the squirrels. So the squirrels, if they come across white oak acorns, they'll tend to eat that right away. When they come across red oak acorns, 
those are the ones that they will take and bury because those have a longer shelf life. They won't germinate until spring. We know that squirrels can um, memorize places where they have buried things up to maybe 9,000 different locations. So they're storing memories in their brain cells whenever they're burying a, an acorn. Some of the time they forget, or maybe they don't need that acorn, and they, and that acorn has a chance to grow into a tree. And that's how we get new oaks and, and new forests. But it's interesting to know that there is this different strategy, different shelf life of white oaks and red oaks, and the squirrels know how to deal with each one of them. Now, you may notice that sometimes our oak trees have an incredibly abundant crop of acorns. And at that point in time, when there's so many acorns that the squirrels can't deal with them, especially with the white oaks, what they'll do is they'll open up the acorn, they'll nip the little seed embryo that's going to germinate into a new tree, and then they will bury the white oak acorns to make sure that they have enough food for the coming winter. So our squirrels are pretty darn smart, prepping and storing food. Our black-capped chickadee, which is our state bird of Massachusetts, has a strategy of also hiding bits of food. And they will start doing this in late summer or fall, early fall. And what they do is they actually grow their brain. Their brain gets bigger in the late summer and the fall. It's the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory storage. And that brain growth, as they're growing that brain, they're getting rid of old cells with old memories. They're growing new cells that can store new memories so they can remember where they've put all this food. And I just have to check my notes to see that they can catch up to 100,000 different food items, 100,000 different hiding places. And we know from, um, from science experiments that those birds will remember at least for a period of weeks where they hid a particular seed, a particular food item. So have some respect for our, for our chickadees, for our birds. Bird brain is, is a compliment, a total compliment. Another strategy that we're probably pretty familiar with because we, we tend to do it in the winter is we just add layers of clothing, right? So you put on your vest, you put on a sweater and you put on a jacket over that, maybe a couple of pairs of socks and you're ready to go out in the, in the cold. Birds do the same thing. Birds that spend the winter here and our bluebirds are spending the winter, they're not migrating. And then the other bird that's on here, the tall one in the swamp is a great blue heron. They're growing extra feathers. And those extra feathers are acting like our down coat. Guess what? They are down because they're feathers. And those feathers are able to add airspace that traps the body heat from these birds, keeps that heat in and keeps the bird warm through the coldest of days. And then you'll see on cold days, birds all fluffed out because they're maximizing that insulation ability of their feathers. In the nighttime, these birds will also huddle together in a closed space. Here is a bird box that's been adapted with multiple perches in it schematically so that a lot of different bluebirds can perch on there and stay warm. Chickadees will do the same thing. Um, again, gather together at night. This is similar to what the flying squirrels did and that helps conserve body warmth. They're also able to go into a mini hibernation state called torpor, 
where their body metabolism will drop, their heart rate, their breathing rate will drop, they're conserving energy to get through the night on those coldest days, and then they're able to come out of that a few hours later and go out in the morning and look for food. Another strategy is that you can sunbathe. Here's a little screech owl in a cavity of a dead tree. Dead trees are really important. Don't cut down trees just because they're dead. If, they're, if you're afraid they're gonna fall on your house, that's one thing. But if they're just dead out in the woods and they look, you think, oh, that doesn't look very neat. Leave it up there because it's really, really valuable for wildlife. So birds will come out and sunbathe, and that's what this little owl is doing. They're trying to warm themselves up by catching the sun's rays, and they will put themselves in a sunny place. You might see a bird stretching its wings. You might see a bird fluffing up its feathers. It's trying to get the sun on its skin at the top of its head. You might see them with their backs to the sun. You might see them out in open aisle, uh, areas like, a, like a, a, a pile of mulch, for example, on a sunny day, and they're just trying to warm up. Another strategy is to change your wardrobe. We all do this in the winter. I've put away my short sleeve shirts and my shorts, they're gonna come out maybe April if I'm lucky. Um, but deer and many other animals actually shed their summer coats and grow a winter one. So the coat on this deer is nice and light tan colored, very smooth, kind of, you know, nice and thin. But in the winter time, the hairs are longer, they're darker, they're shaggy, and they're hollow. So the hollowness of the hair acts as extra insulation. The dark color allows them to absorb more heat from the sun. And then the shagginess and length acts like putting another blanket on. So it helps keep them warmer. Deer will also change their behavior in the winter time. They will gather into sheltered places, usually under some, some evergreen trees and they will have a little community center there. So they will gather in groups, that's called a deer yard. In winter, deer are 50% less active than they are in summer. So they don't wander as much and they consume 30% less food. So they're really ramping down their metabolism and trying to stay close and close together. Um, in order to make it through the winter. That's our deer. In the wetlands, we have other things going on. So let's think about life in a, in a water world. So there's a clue in this picture that somebody is out and about and active, and you might see it right here, right in the middle. Something's been eating that tree. I wonder who eats trees in the middle of swamps? Bingo, it's our beaver. Beavers will, are active during the winter, a little bit, a, a little bit less active than they are. They cut branches and bring them close to their lodge. Here's a beaver lodge. And that branch is like, a, it's, it's like a pantry. So they don't have to go very far to eat. So what they, um, how they build their lodge is they start with rocks on the bottom, they pile logs on top of it, and then they cover the whole thing with mud. And they are doing this late summer and fall, as long as the mud is workable. And then there's a hole, there's a chamber in the middle of that where they hang out, and often frogs will hang out in there as well. And underneath the water, there are one or two entrances. So the beaver can swim through this tunnel and then go up into the chamber that's above the water and hang out. And this is where the beaver kits are born and live for the first um, couple weeks or months of their life. And it's nice and it's relatively warmer in there. It's above, it's above freezing, still cold, but above freezing. And as I said, other, other animals might also 
um, hang out in there like frogs, and sometimes muskrats. So the winter comes in, the ice comes through, but these animals will can stay under the ice. They can get their, um, get their, their food from the branches that they've put into the water nearby in the lodge. There's a little breathing hole up through the top. And on cold days, you can sometimes see the steam coming through. Now, we also have other animals that are active in the winter and you might see in the wetlands, you might see this kind of a structure, which is the home of another animal or muskrats, which sometimes people mistake for beavers, but they have little rat tails and the beaver's tail is wide and flat and they're generally smaller and they're out during the daytime when beavers are most active at night. So these guys will spend the winter in these little, these little homes, whoops, um, and they're also active under the ice, eating things like cattails and other the roots of other water plants. And they're swimming around and you can see them sometimes under, under the ice and they'll leave trails of bubbles and are, they're, they're active. We have other things that are living under the ice or have to deal with the ice. Our, let's think about our, our frogs and salamanders. So we have this kind of salamander called a red spotted newt. And on land, you might see these orange creatures roaming around in spring, summer, and fall. These are the teenage newts. The adult newts, this guy with the gills, um, let's see, maybe on the other side. Yeah, here he is. The adult newts live in the water and they're active under the ice year round. They might move slowly because it's cold, but they're still active. So you'll find these guys in beaver ponds. The frog on the left is a wood frog and he doesn't spend the winter in the water. He spends it in the forest and he freezes solid like a frogsicle. And he will warm up when the, when the temperature comes above freezing. So he has special antifreeze in his veins, in, in his blood that keeps the ice crystals outside of the cells so that they, when he does freeze um, and the ice forms, it doesn't hurt him. And so we have right now outside frozen frogs in the woods. And you'll see these guys in spring. Also under the ice, we have turtles and fish and lots of insect larvae. Here's a baby dragonfly nymph. And these are all active generally in the mud the pond only freezes on the top layer, not underneath. So life can still go on. Turtles will bury themselves in the mud. They have the ability to take in water through their skin, especially in their tail area. So if you have small children in your life, you can tell them that turtles breathe through their butts and they will be absolutely delighted. Tracks. Real quick, going through tracks, a way to enjoy winter is to look for the prints of animals. And there are four patterns of tracks based on how an animal moves. So things like our rabbits, mice, squirrels, and chipmunks hop. They put their front feet, which are smaller, down first, and they swing their back feet out in front of their front feet so that their back feet are, are in front. The toes are always pointed in the direction that the animal is traveling. Things like our otters and minks and fisher cats conserve energy by putting their front feet and their back feet in the same place. So they make a pattern that is two by two, two by two, two by two. Otters like to slide on their bellies. So if you come across a track that looks like this, you found an otter generally near water. We have zigzaggers like deer and fox and coyotes that step very carefully in order to conserve energy. Remember that the deer are 30% less active, sorry, 50% less active in the wintertime. So they're, they're really all about conserving energy. So they will try and put their feet in about the same place and they're walking pretty slowly. Um, this is an area where a lot of deer have been moving around. So this isn't a really good picture that shows the patterns, but you can see just two toes and those are the hoof prints of, of deer. And then 
animals that waddle like raccoons and bear, skunks, woodchucks, and porcupines, if you're lucky enough to see porcupines, kind of waddle from side to side and you'll see individual footprints. The front feet here, the hind feet over here, and they make a waddling trail that's very, very different. Mass Wildlife has this great guide to tracks. And just as a little test for you, something fun, here is a picture of an animal that made tracks. The toes are down here, so the animal was going from top to bottom. The line is about an inch to an inch and a half long. And if the toes here have, show the claws, and to me, they're very pointed. So I go over to the card and I match up the, um, I match up the, the symbols. And I am going to say that this is either going to be a weasel or a fisher. And if this picture is true to scale, it's small enough that it needs to be a weasel over here, just by the shape of the paws. But it's always really important to note the size as well as the pattern. Sometimes animals will leave behind what we call scat, which is a nice word for poop. And owls and hawks and other kinds of birds, raptors, birds that are hunters, will cough up, up pellets of the undigestible parts of what they've eaten. So in this picture, you can see that there's the lower jawbone with a tooth of something that looks like it was probably a mouse. This came from an owl. Here's the scat of a fisher, and here's the scat of a coyote. Our wild dogs like fishers and coyotes and foxes tend to have a lot of hair in their scat, which is one way that you can tell them from um, the scat of a domestic dog. And that is our show for today. So we started out by acknowledging those who have come before us and those who are still with us and the stewardship that they have given to the land. We talked about the challenges of winter, especially the alternation between um, cold and warm, the freeze thawing and the general lack of water. Some strategies that trees create in the winter, um, bark is their first line of defense and losing their leaves is a big one. And then some different strategies that animals ex exploit to make it through the winter and how you can appreciate the wildlife that is all around us in this season. Thank you so very much for your time. And I will just leave this up as a thank you. Here's a little bit of contact information about how you can reach me and reach us at Broadmeadow Brook right here in Worcester. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.